Thank you. I want to thank Madam President, uh, Chief of Staff Davis, and Aaliyah for the invite. It is wonderful to see young women at the helm of one of the most important political institutions at a critical juncture in our world history. Thank you. My name is Yeshi Milner, and I am the founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. We are a movement of scientists and activists working to make data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression. Today it's with honor and actually great pleasure of mine to argue against the motion of the House that AI is an existential threat. In a time of genocidal warfare, extreme income inequality driven by inflation and other economic practices, and at the same time immense political division, I'm here to argue that the true existential threat is the concentration of power in the form of data in the hands of a few. You see the opposition nodding, so there you go. <laughs> but before I get into my argument, I want to define existential threat. As stated in the motion, but also in the context of AI, it is not a blanket vanilla term, but one grounded in the resurgence of a distinct philosophical tradition, eugenics. It's interesting that the opposition opened with the paperclip experiment because that's a concept authored by Mr. Nick Bostrom, the founder, one of the founders of the, what's called the X crisis movement. He defines existential risk as an event that could cause human extinction or permanently or drastically curtail humanity's potential. This is different from a global catastrophic risk, as he defines it, which we can recover from. And the use of the term existential threat instead of risk is actually as a, a linguistic trope in order to make the threat appear more dire. He builds on these ideas of existential risk using transhumanist concepts like diastogenic pressures. Diastogenic is the opposite of eugenic. And it's based on the theory that people who were deemed inferior, categorically, racially, would reproduce faster. They're the threat. Dysogenic pressures are only solved by eugenics practices. Eugenics was an international movement articulating genetic hypotheses, research, and immense policy prescriptions. During the first three decades of the 20th century, Eugenics, along with racism and imperialism, <laughs> had profound influence on thinking in Europe, in the U it originated in the UK, but in Germany, France, Scandinavia, and North America, where I live in the US. And there it became more than a theory, but a political and ideological regime. While Bostrom or anyone in the singularity or X-crisis movement didn't invent eugenics, it lasted well before their time. And if we were to be honest, it shapes the very data science and scientific management practices of today. So there's actually another context to this definition of existential risk that I want to bring in because it's not what's being said and defined, it's also what's been redacted. Bostrom admitted to writing a racist email where he stated, Take, for example, the following sentence. Blacks are more stupid than whites. I like that sentence, and I think it's true. But recently, I've begun to believe that I won't have much success with that with most people if I speak like that, that they would think that I were racist, that I disliked black people and thought it was fair if blacks were treated badly. I don't. It's just that based on what I have read, I think it's probable that black people have a lower average IQ than mankind in general. And I think that IQ is highly correlated with what we normally mean by smart and stupid. I can go on with this email, but he ends it by using the, the N-word, which he does not redact, by the way. I don't just come to you as someone who's the movement of an organization that I started in 2017 to counteract the ways in which data is weaponized against black people. I come to you as somebody who understands quite literally this idea of risk. The very first time I even heard the word risk or threat was at nine years old. In the computer lab at my elementary school, another young student said, 
I'm at risk. Shocked, I said, what are you talking about you're at risk? Like, are you okay? Because she was enrolled in an at-risk, an after-school program for at-risk youth, she believed what they had told her was that she would one day be at risk of early pregnancy, prison, early death, <laughs> uh, joining a gang. And to be honest, for so many of the young people that I went to elementary school and high school with, that became a self-fulfilling prophecy. While I survived what we know in the US as a school to prison pipeline, many people did not. And my high school graduation, the first row were of empty seats to commemorate people who, would, who died too soon. As a young black person, I've learned how to navigate this world where to be black is to be a problem, to be a threat, to be a risk. And these ideas that I have to encount and fight as stereotypes of just, dark, of, of just the mere fact of being darker pigmented have been ingrained, automated into the public imagination in the very same way that they've been encoded into powerful artificial intelligence technologies of today and weaponized by those who currently have control and power. One example that I'll use is of credit scores. I brought this demand to the White House just this month, to Congress, to, about, to abolish FICO, which is the predominant, most powerful algorithm at work in our country. FICO is the Fair and Isaac Corporation. It was started by a mathematician and an engineer 25 years ago to use artificial intelligence as a way to eliminate human bias when providing people access to credit. The inputs to the FICO algorithm, as we're told, are the amount of debt we have, the percentage of missed payments. Um, all of this information are provided through a collusion of data brokers, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Experian, which is actually a UK-based company. And then they're fed into the FICO algorithm. According to the shareholder reports at FICO, their scores are their number one product. Without a credit score, you can't rent a house. You can't qualify for student loans. You can't, increasingly, you can't get a job in America. And black people are three times more likely to be scored at below 620 than white people, even when controlling for education, debt, and income. FICO scores reflect the ways in which algorithms hold such tremendous power over our lives. And as I mentioned, the impact is not on everyone. Yes, there is a threat, but it's not evenly distributed. Right here in the UK, according to the Color of Money report, black and Bangladeshi families have 10 times less wealth than white families. Black Caribbean families have 20 pence for every $1 made by white families. And to even go back to the US example, what's the impact of credit scores? Black people are 13% of the population, but represent 55% of unhoused. And I speak about this with passion because I grew up with a single mother who put herself through college, graduate school, sent her kids to Ivy League colleges on a full ride was a leader in her community, but because of these black box algorithms that are racially encoded and quite powerful with no recourse, we often were homeless, all because of a three-digit number. While it is in violation of federal law to deny people housing, employment, and education based on race, you can't sue an algorithm. Algorithms have now become not godlike, not super intelligent, but the way for people to be racist without being a racist. By definition, what is an algorithm? This is what makes up artificial intelligence. It's a step-by-step -step process to solve a problem. A recipe is an algorithm. A list of instructions to make the dish, the ingredients that make up the dish, and a result based on what we define as success. Whether we want to focus on making something healthy or something that just tastes good regardless of health, 
These, quest these decisions are determined by a question. What are we optimizing? Algorithms are not just input and output. They're based on the objective function. What are we optimizing? For computational algorithms, what we are discussing is much more complex, but the function remains the same. Today, I ask all of you, are we optimizing for a future where data, AI, is being used as a tool to promote equity, fairness, justice, and for everybody, including communities of color? Or a techno-feudalist society where a machine learning model doles out mass suffering? To quote a political theorist that we, that we love, <laughs> Akile Membe, who has done ex extensive work on, on actual threats, especially on the idea of necropolitics. Necropolitics is the use of social and political power to dictate how some people may live and how some people must die. The deployment of necropolitics create what he calls death worlds or new and unique forms of existence which vast populations are subjected to living conditions that confer upon them the status of the dead. I come to you from the land of the dead, communities where people have been stripped of opportunities, where the fire hoses and police dogs of the past have been replaced with the FICO algorithms, scoring models, and risk assessments of the present. We are not afraid of AI becoming human. What we are afraid of is how it is going to be used, and it has been used, to enforce, to reinforce, and justify long-held beliefs of who is human and who is not. Who deserves the rights and privileges afforded by not just sentience, but life? We need to pause, we don't need to pause AI, sorry. <laughs> but we need to abolish big data. We need to dismantle the structures that put the power of data into the hands of a very few. Yes. No, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get to what I'm gonna talk about. No, but let me finish. <laughs> because let me say it, if we focus on AI as an existential threat, we miss the opportunity to put these powerful tools into the hands of people who need it the most. At Data for Black Lives, we are reclaiming data as protest, as accountability, and as collective action. Through my work, which you can read about online and look at we've been able to shape the role that data plays in public life. And we want to invite all of you to not just join us in voting for the opposition, but join our movement to finally change the cast of characters of not just who's at these debates, but who's at the table around how these technologies are made. Thank you.